Continuing in our series through Acts, and today, uh, as I've uh, indicated, uh, we're going to be, of course, talking about the conversion of Saul. And this kind of continues uh, with our theme from last week uh, uh, around the idea of people getting converted while traveling out on the road. Uh, Last week, we saw the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And he was out on the road. Uh, Remember how God uh, had Philip, uh, remember chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, kind of looks at the ministry of Philip, and God sends Philip to this specific road uh, south of Jerusalem where Philip meets this man, and God tells Philip to go be by this man, and and, uh, and that just all of this leads to Philip witnessing to this man. And it all happens while out on the road. And one of the takeaways from last week was uh, just looking at how amazing it was that God orchestrated so many little events, little like Philip go south, Philip go to this road, Philip see that man over there, go be by him. God orchestrated all of these little events in history so that just this one man could hear the good news of Jesus. And as I said last week, we don't even know this man's name. Uh, We do know where he comes from. We know what his job was. He was the uh, he was in charge of the treasury back home in uh, in the kingdom of Ethiopia, but we don't know much else about him. We we don't know we we don't know how this man came to be worshiping the God of the Bible. Remember, he had been in Jerusalem to worship God there. He he somehow in his life he uh, he came to worship God, and he was in Jerusalem, and that's how he met Philip. And then he, and then once he meets Philip, and once he's baptized, uh, he just kind of disappears. And we don't know how his how his conversion experience. We don't know how you know the fact that he's now a Christian, how that changed his life. We don't know any of that. He just comes into the story and then leaves. But his experience, as it's recorded for us, is very memorable, and it's a wonderful demonstration of the grace of God. And how God is willing to work in history to get the gospel out to the world. And really our story today repeats these same kinds of ideas. Our story today is again a wonderful demonstration of what God is willing to do to spread the gospel message and and meet people where they are at. And in this case, once again, God is meeting someone out on the road. However, that is about where the similarities end. Uh, Yes, both people are on the road traveling somewhere, uh, but unlike the story last week with the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, our story today, uh, our story today, there there is no Philip. You know, there's no one, uh, God's not leading anyone to obediently uh, go evangelize the person in our story today. As a matter of fact, in our story today, uh, there will be nobody but Jesus alone confronting today's traveler. And the traveler in our story today is a much different kind of person from the one that we saw last week. Uh, last week, the traveler was a Gentile. He was an Ethiopian. That's, uh, Gentiles are just everyone who's not a Jew. But this week, uh, the traveler is someone who is very Jewish. A Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. And you know, in last week we saw how the, the Ethiopian eunuch he was very uh, he was very open minded he was very open hearted he was he was open to change, but the traveler in our story today would have never been able to be changed at least not by the wisdom of man the wisdom of man was never going to change the person in our story today. If he's ever going to be corrected, he's going to need a much firmer hand to correct him. And of course, I'm talking about Saul. Our story today is about the conversion of Saul. We've already been introduced to Saul. He comes into the story first at the end of chapter 7. Uh, he, was present, uh, he was present when the Jewish mob killed Stephen. Remember, he watched over the coats of those who were stoning Stephen, and he, the text says he gave his approval of their killing him. And Saul himself You know, Saul himself was a zealous participant in the persecution of the church. You know, it says that Saul went from house to house, dragging off men and women, putting them in prison, 
Saul despised the church. A much different person than, than, uh, than the open-hearted, open-minded Ethiopian we saw last week. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons that Saul is even out on the road today, uh, he's not going home. You know, the Ethiopian, he was going home back to Ethiopia. That's why he's on the road. Well, Saul isn't going home. Saul is on the road for a different reason. Saul is on the road to Damascus. And what's motivating Saul to go to Damascus? Well, what's Saul's driving ambition in life at this point? It's to destroy the church. And Saul is going to Damascus to continue with that ambition. He's going there to continue his drive to destroy the church, to hunt down any Christians who might be hiding uh, even in cities far away, such as Damascus is. And this kind of gives us an image of the amount of contempt and hatred that Saul must have had in his heart for the Christians at this time. You know, it takes a certain level of hatred in your heart to be motivated to go to these lengths. Because we have plenty of examples in history where two people groups don't tolerate one another. You know, uh, you could have two people groups that say, you know, I'll stay here with my people. You stay over there with your people. You don't bother me. I won't bother you. That's one level of intolerance. But this, what Saul wants to do, this is a whole nother level. You could even put a label on it of genocide. You know, genocide is probably the most accurate way to describe how Saul felt towards the church. He was genocidal against the church. He didn't just want the Christians to be out of Jerusalem. You know, it wasn't enough for the Christians to be driven away from the Jewish world. Saul wanted the Christians to be eradicated from the earth. That is top-tier levels of hatred to be motivated to wipe out an entire people group because of what they believe. Saul didn't just want to wipe out the religion. You know, Saul didn't want to just stamp out Christianity. He wanted to stamp out the Christians themselves. That's where Saul is at this point. You know, I doubt any of us have been uh, this deep in in, in our own loathing and hatred of somebody else. But that's where Saul is. That's how, that's how the, we are introduced to him in the story of Acts. And that's how he is when he meets Jesus. His heart is full of hatred for the very people that Jesus died for. And it's hard to imagine that any person other than Jesus could have possibly have changed Saul. But by God's grace, Jesus met him. The one person, the one, uh, the one encounter that could possibly have any hope of changing this man. This man is so full of hatred, so full of determination, uh, willing, to go, uh, willing to go to extraordinary lengths to see his mission fulfilled. How could someone like that ever be changed? By Christ alone. And by God's grace, it was Christ who met him. And the grace that God showed to Saul at this moment, you know, that it didn't end with just Saul, uh, you know, as, as amazing as it is. Uh, this act of God intervening in Saul's life would go on to set off a chain reaction uh, that would eventually result in the very foundation of the church becoming solidified on, solidified on the cornerstone of Christ. Because, as we know, we can look back with 2,000 years of hindsight and see that uh, after this moment, after Saul's conversion, Uh, Saul would go on to be probably the greatest church planter in history. And of course, he would go on to write 13 letters. Uh, He certainly wrote more than just 13 letters, but 13 of his letters would go on to make uh, 13 books in our New Testament. Uh, Some make the claim that aside from Jesus himself, uh, Saul, later known, more known, better known to us as Paul, uh, is one of the most important figures In Christian history, he is in the top, top, top most important figures in Christian history. And that makes our story today one of the most important and most consequential moments in Christian history. Certainly, uh, certainly the cross is at the very top. The, the life of Jesus is at the very top. But as far as, uh, as far as moments 
that have a broad impact. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the hater of Christians, into Paul the Apostle, the spreader of the gospel, the planter of churches, the, 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 the lover of Jesus. That is one of the most important moments in the church and in the world where this brilliant, determined man met Jesus and his life was set on a new course. It's quite the account. It's quite the, it's quite the, uh, it's quite the build-up for what's to come later on in Acts. So let's read this account now. Let's read the account of this, uh, of this Saul. You know, Saul, uh, he's, uh, he's had his, uh, he's had his uh, start off in life of, uh, of being so far from Jesus, but now Jesus is about to come into his life in a dramatic way. The same Jesus, he was so determined to make an enemy. Saul was so determined to make Jesus his enemy. But starting today, Jesus is going to be his Lord. Our passage this morning is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. So if you have your Bibles, or if you have the Scripture handouts, uh, you are welcome to read along with me, and we can read uh, Acts chapter 9. Let's read about uh, Jesus confronting Saul on the road to Damascus. So Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Uh, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, uh, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you, will, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. So our passage this morning uh, starts off by giving us a colorful description of how deeply Saul hated the Lord's disciples. Uh, in, in our version this morning, in the text this morning is from the NIV, uh, and it says that he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's uh, disciples. Uh, now, this, this, obviously, this is a, that's a powerful uh, statement, it certainly gives us the image of uh, certainly gives us the image of a, of the depth of hate that Saul has, but this doesn't quite grasp how this phrase works in the Greek. Uh, a better translation would be the NASB, where it says that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You know the N- the NIV, the top one. It makes it seem like Saul was like speaking threats, like he, his speech contained threats against the disciples. But the NASB, you know, breathing threats and murder. That gives us a bit of a different image. It gives us the image of you know the very breath that Saul breathed was full of threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. You know, as if, as, if, as if what was sustaining Saul, like how we are sustained by our breathing, we're sustained by the air, like we need to be able to breathe. Well, what sustained Saul was his threats and his murder, his hatred. His hatred for the Christians kept him going. It's a very, uh, very... Uh, striking way to describe someone's disposition is he, he he just he he was completely consumed by his desire to see these people wiped out and and in his desire to eliminate the church uh, of course he goes to as our passage says he goes to the high priest to request letters he uh, he ha- he needs to have these letters so that the synagogues in Damascus uh, might give him uh, the authority to haul off the Christians and this too shows how determined Saul was to destroy the church because Damascus uh, you know, it's not just a little quick trip up to Damascus. 
If Saul most likely was starting in Jerusalem, well, he had to have been. He, if he went to the high priest, well, the high priest is in Jerusalem. And if Saul wanted to go to Damascus, well, that's a six-day journey. Saul was willing to travel six days for the possibility of finding more Christians. So this gives us another picture of just how determined Saul was to catch and destroy as many followers of Jesus as possible. If he, if he thought that there was the possibility that his six-day journey to Damascus could find, in that he could find more Christians, he thought it was worth it. That's just, that's so, it, it, it's, it's, such a, it's, it's such a dramatic picture of a man completely given over to one mission, one goal, utter destruction of the church. And he almost gets there. He almost gets to his goal. He almost completes the journey. But as it says, he was near Damascus. Saul was near Damascus. And that's when he encountered Jesus. A bright light shone around him. He fell to the ground. You know, he, he, he's utterly knocked, un, he's, not, he's utterly knocked clean off of his track. Now, this mention of a bright light uh, shining all around him is made even more significant by, uh, by what, when we know this event occurred. Uh, later on in the book of Acts, and in, in chapter 22, uh, in Acts chapter 22, it records the account for us of Saul, uh, Saul remembering this moment. Uh, this exact moment in the book of Acts is retold for us from the perspective of Saul later on in Acts 22. And he says, about noon, as I came near Damascus, bright light, I fell to the ground. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, so this event happened around noon. As, Paul say, uh, as Saul says, uh, right around noon, the brightest time of the day. And yet, when the Lord Jesus came to him, uh, even in the brightest daylight, Lord Jesus shone even brighter. Can you imagine how startling all of this must have been? You know, you're, you're traveling, you're on your way, you're, you're almost to your destination. It's the middle of the day. It's been a long journey. And then suddenly, boom, out of nowhere, blinding light out of heaven. And you fall down on your face and you hear that voice. It says that the men who were traveling with Saul, they too heard the voice, but they did not see anyone. And later on again when Saul, uh, Saul actually retells this story two times. Uh, later on again when Saul is retelling this story, he will say that his companions, yes, they heard the voice, but they didn't understand what they were hearing. Only Saul understood the words. And the first words that he heard were, why do you persecute me? Saul, why do you persecute me? This is, of course, Jesus. This is, of course, Jesus confronting Saul about all that he had done. All the darkness in his heart, all the anger, all the hatred in his heart. He's confronted by Jesus. Why? Are you doing this? And notice how Jesus identifies himself as the one being persecuted. You know, he doesn't ask him, why do you persecute my disciples? Why do you persecute my followers? No, Jesus says, why do you persecute me? The suffering that the church endured at the hands of Saul, Jesus takes that suffering personally. So personally, in fact, that he considers the church's suffering to be his own suffering. And, you know, this is a natural outworking of uh, other things Jesus has said, such as uh, what he said in Luke chapter 10. Where he says, whoever rejects you rejects me. And it's very easy to extend that to whoever persecutes you persecutes me. Jesus does not sit back and watch the church be persecuted. Jesus is so invested in the church that he himself is persecuted when the church is persecuted. And Jesus confirms this. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. 
The persecution against the church is persecution against Jesus himself. And this gives us pause. Uh, This is a reminder that uh, when we are amongst our fellow believers in a place like this, uh, it's not just you and I. It's not just us and them. We are not individuals free to treat each other in any way we like. When the church is called the body of Christ, this is a clear indication that Jesus takes us as a body, as his body, very seriously. Remember Jesus' words, whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And that can go both ways. Yes, we did it for him when we bless, but also we did it to him when we curse, when we persecute, when we harm. And one day we will come face to face with Jesus, as Paul did, and I imagine that one of the last things any one of us wants to hear him say is, Why did you persecute me? Why did you treat me so poorly? Why did you not love me like I asked you to? Jesus says that that is a very real possibility. Some will say, Lord, Lord. And Jesus will say, get away from me. I never knew you. Some will say, Lord, when did we treat you badly? He said, when you treated one of the least of these badly, you were treating me badly. That's one one of those things we have to contend with. It's one of those things we have to take seriously. We have the witness from history. We have the words of Jesus saying, no, this is how it is. When the body of Christ is mistreated, you are mistreating me. And of course, we can point to examples out there in the world or even examples in our own lives when we have been mistreated. But let's not let this uh, make us forget that we ourselves can be a Saul. We ourselves can be the ones guilty. And we ourselves can be the ones who need to repent. But if we do repent, if we do change our ways, then of course there is forgiveness. Of course there is grace. Now, none of us have persecuted the church like Saul has. I pray none of us ever do. You know, Saul's actions against the church were very serious. But when Jesus confronted Saul... And Saul immediately humbles himself. Saul is immediately humble before Jesus. And Jesus is willing to forgive. He's willing to forgive even this man who has caused so much harm. The man known for destroying the church. He humbles himself before Jesus. And Jesus is willing to forgive. And not only is Jesus willing to forgive Saul, but Jesus comes to Saul with a task with a mission. He says, get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. It's like Jesus is saying, okay, Saul, I see that you are humble in my presence. Good. Now you know who I am. Now you know what you are dealing with. Now I have a job for you. Get up. Go. You have a mission to fulfill. You you hated me before, but now you've seen me face to face, and you are humble. And that is good. And I forgive you. Now I have a job for you. How extraordinary is this grace that Jesus is showing Saul at this moment? You know, how great must the weight of Saul's sin be right here? He has an unbearable weight of guilt against him. He has participated in the murder of Christians. But when Jesus confronts him and Saul prostrates himself and he humbles himself, Jesus forgives him. Not only does he forgive him, but Jesus has a use for him. Jesus makes great use of him. Imagine how different all of this must be from what Saul was used to growing up as a Jew. As you know, as a Jew, Saul would have been responsible to make atonement for his own sin. Saul was responsible for his own sin. There would have been a cost to receiving forgiveness. A sacrifice had to be made. The blood of an animal needed to be shed. But when Saul is confronted by Jesus and told that he is persecuting Jesus, you know, you can imagine that Saul had a moment of dread, a moment of, oh no, I've really messed up now. A moment of realizing how badly he had gotten it all wrong. 
how he deserved so much punishment for what he had done. But instead of being punished, instead of being told to make some kind of sacrifice, he's told to stand up, get up, go into the city. I have a mission for you. I have a use for you. You know, talk about having your entire worldview shattered in a moment. Uh, Saul's mission in life had been to destroy the church because he believed that the church followed a false Messiah who spoke blasphemous lies. But now he's confronted by that Messiah. And it turns out that he, Saul, is the one who is speaking blasphemy. He was the one who was wrong the whole time. You know, that's a lot to process. That's a lot to take in. But thankfully, Saul has a lot of time to process it because he's going to be blind for three days. He's going to be blind. He's not going to eat anything for three days. You know, if you're spending three days blind, not eating or drinking, then what are you doing? You're thinking. You're spending your time doing a lot of thinking, a lot of assessing, a lot of pondering. A lot of processing of how this new reality that you've just been confronted with, what does it mean? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for the world? What does it mean that the Christians have actually been right this whole time? And of course, certainly Saul had the thought, how did I miss it? How did I miss Jesus? You know, Saul, of all people, who knew the Bible as well as anyone, you know, Saul, it's very possible that Saul had his entire Bible memorized, our, our Old Testament memorized, but he missed it. He missed Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah. How did this happen? Well, he's got three days to figure that out. Well, he's got more than that, but he's got three days to do nothing but figure it out. And certainly, and certainly as history shows us, he will figure it out. He will get it all worked out. So that's Saul. That's Jesus confronting Saul. That's the grace that Jesus shows to Saul. And I want to close this morning by taking a look at what Saul's immediate reaction was when he came face to face with Jesus. When Jesus asks him, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? And really, you know, this is the same question that the Ethiopian eunuch had last week. I remember last week uh, when Philip encountered the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah, specifically the suffering servants. And when Philip talks to him about it, the, the, the man asks, Who is this? Who is Isaiah talking about? Who is this suffering servant? The Ethiopian eunuch was confronted by Jesus in Scripture, the text of Scripture. He saw Jesus there and he said, who is this? And now in our story today, Saul is confronted by Jesus in person, in the flesh. And Saul asks, who are you? Who are you? Who are you, Lord? You know, Saul didn't know who this was. Who are you? He didn't know who this was. But Saul knew what this was. It was his Lord. Who are you, Lord? I don't know who you are, but my goodness, you are my Lord. And soon, Saul will find out that he is also his Savior. Saul's encounter with Jesus gives us a clear picture of who Jesus is in two, uh, two important ways. Because, uh, because Saul's encounter with Jesus uh, gives us clarity about two common misunderstandings that our world has in regards to Jesus. Because Saul encounters two great things, two great truths. He encounters Jesus' power, and he encounters Jesus' grace. And that's two things that our world just does not understand. Our world does not understand how much power Jesus has. And our world does not understand how much grace Jesus has. You know, not everyone is confronted by Jesus in such a dramatic way as we see in our story today. Uh, but we do well to take this story to heart because uh, one day, one day we are promised we all are going to stand before Jesus. 
Jesus will return in power and glory, and we all will be like Saul. The Bible says, when Jesus returns, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When Jesus returns, we are all going to be on our knees just like Saul is here, in reverence to the great and mighty power. You know, the power of Jesus to prostrate all of creation, to send all of creation down on its knees, that's a power that our world, well, our world scoffs at it, doesn't it? Our world scoffs at Jesus. Our world mocks the idea that we owe our allegiance to Christ alone. Some even go so far as to say that, you know, if there is a God and I find myself in his presence, I will refuse to worship him. You know, if that's their attitude, well, then one day they are promised they will be in his presence. They will be in his presence. And if they, in their hearts, say, I'm not going to worship him, they are going to be terrified of him. Our story today gives us just a little glimpse of the power of Jesus, a little glimpse, and it's enough to knock Saul down on his face and make his hard heart be molded into the image of Christ in a moment. Saul was so far gone. He was so far gone, deep in his anger, in his hatred, in his rage, in a little glimpse of Jesus, and it all came crashing down. And the Bible promises that one day, it won't be just a glimpse that we get. We're going to get the whole thing. He's going to come in power and glory And we will fall to our knees, and some will worship, some will cry out in fear. The world does not understand the power of Christ, but thank the Lord that we have these examples for us. And the other thing that the world doesn't understand is the grace of Christ. With power, with the awesome power of Christ, comes grace. And our world today doesn't really understand grace. In our world, like in Saul's world, someone has to pay. And even in our world, we know that there are those who believe that some injustices can never be undone. Our world has a list of sins that it considers to be unforgivable. But with Jesus, in his power and his grace, he has already paid the ultimate price for sin. He paid it with his own life by going to his death the only debt of gratitude that we owe that could never be paid off is the debt that we owe to jesus for what he's done for us because we have failed jesus we have failed jesus more than anyone else we owe the greatest debt to jesus and yet jesus offers us grace the kind of grace that the world doesn't understand because it's free grace we don't have to earn it in fact we can't earn it we don't have to build up to it we don't have to save for it it's just there offered to us the grace of the lord is there for the taking we don't have to do anything for it that's the kind of grace that the world doesn't understand. We, we always feel like we need to have a little bit of justification for ourselves. See, I contributed. I contributed a little bit. I did my part. But with Jesus, a little bit will never get you there. A lot will never get you there. An entire lifetime of work will never get you there. Our debt is too great because of our sin. And God knew that. So he made it free. He made it completely free. Free for the taking. We can't work for it. So there's no point in working for it. There's no point in even trying to work for it. As a matter of fact, we're told we're not supposed to do that. The grace that we need to be reconciled back to God, we cannot even begin to think that we can work for it. It's free. It's free because that grace has already been paid for by someone else. The very one who offers it to us, Jesus Christ himself. The insurmountable 
the, the insurmountable weight of guilt that someone like a Saul has, and that we all have, was paid for on the cross. You know, I love the image of anybody's uh, ever read Pilgrim's Progress. And his burden, you know, he's carrying this burden. And when he gets to the cross, his burden falls off. Just automatically falls off at the cross. It's a burden that Jesus alone was capable of carrying because he had the power. The power to cover all of the sins. He had the precious blood, the blood capable of cleansing all of the sins. He had the perfect life, the life that by his grace he earned everything for himself. Jesus Christ earned all of the glory for himself. He earned everything he has. And he graciously offers what he earned to us. Now, death could not hold him. Death could not hold Jesus. Death had to give him up. He defeated it. He conquered it. One day he will do away with it. And his victory he willingly gives to us. The power and the grace of Jesus. Transforming the world. It's quite the confrontation. It's just a little glimpse in history. You know, this is, a, this is a short story. It's not really all that long of a story. It's just a moment in a man's life of Jesus coming in. Flash! Who are you, Lord? Who are you that you can do all of this for me? Who is this Lord with such power and such grace? It's Jesus. No one else. No one else but Jesus. And the grace that he showed to Saul, he can show to every one of us. The grace that he offered to Saul, get up. I got a job for you now. You're humble. Good. You know who I am. Good. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget my power. Don't forget my power, but experience my grace. Go now into your life in my grace, knowing my power. And that is offered to every single one of us. We can all be like Saul. We can all be like Saul. Going from our encounter with Christ into our life with a new life, a new mission, new purpose, new goal. But first we have to ask. We have to wonder. We have to want that Lord. Who are you? Who are you, Lord? Because I want you. I don't understand you. I have never seen anything like you, but I want you. Who are you? Please tell me. It's Jesus. Let's pray. So, Father God, Lord, I thank you what you did for Saul and what he would go on to do, how it influences our lives even to this day. But Lord, I thank you for the example of your grace coming to this sinful, sinful man, showing us the example of how your grace is offered to each and every single one of us. Lord, I pray that our hearts genuinely want you. That we don't underestimate your power, that we don't underestimate your grace, that we be confronted with who you are, and when we are, we, uh, we can't help but want more of it, that we see the beauty in it, the amazing transformation that we can have in it, and we want more of it, Lord. May your grace and your power transform us as we go into our week. May we remember, may we remember what you've done for us. Things we pray in your name. Amen.